I'm Christopher DeSimone, cardiologist and director of marketing. And today we'll be discussing intervening in asymptomatic aortic stenosis. I'm joined by my colleague, Patricia Pelica, consultant and professor of medicine and an expert in this area. Welcome, Dr. Pelica. Thank you, Chris. Good to be here. Excellent. So, Dr. Pelica, what's been the traditional management of patients with aortic stenosis? Well, that's a good question. The traditional management has been to monitor progression of aortic stenosis with echocardiography over the years. And of course, it's a gradually progressive disease. And then when the patient develops symptoms, and the classic triad of symptoms are angina, syncope or presyncope, and um, dyspnea or heart failure, then that would be the time to intervene. Or the guidelines say that if the ejection fraction started to fall, being less than 50%, that that would be a reasonable time to intervene. Excellent. So based on symptoms or clinical manifestations. Now, yep. you being an expert echocardiographer and a pioneer in this field, what information does the echo provide? What should people be really looking at or keen on? Or what do you do in your practice that you really hone in on to say, hmm, what sort of level of severity of aortic stenosis am I dealing with? So really evaluating aortic stenosis requires a very careful and comprehensive assessment in the echo lab. And of course, we're really looking for that time point when it becomes severe. So we are measuring the gradient across the aortic valve, the mean gradient, the Doppler-derived aortic valve area using the continuity equation. The peak velocity across the aortic valve is also used as one parameter of severe aortic stenosis. And then we're measuring stroke volume, but we also carefully measure um, ejection fraction, the, um, the stroke volume index, right ventricular systolic pressure, and diastolic pressure, and increasingly, we're even measuring global longitudinal strain. And all these parameters can be important in, uh, in detecting progression, significant progression of aortic stenosis. But the markers of severe aortic stenosis are classically a peak velocity of greater than or equal to four meters per second, a mean gradient greater than or equal to 40 millimeters mercury, and the Doppler-derived aortic valve area of less than or equal to one centimeter squared. And sometimes in patients of the extremes of body size, we'll use an indexed um, value for the valve area with it being less than 0.6 centimeters squared per meter squared would be indicative of severe AS. So those are all golden pearls. And I think it's important to highlight, you know, we're looking at the structure of the valve, but really what really gets down to this is the physiology and the comprehensive kind of Doppler derived hemodynamics across the valve. Now, one thing, those are some of the, the, the really high points and excellent, thank you very much. One thing that sometimes is maybe unclear or some people may not have even heard about or are less familiar with is this entity of low output aortic stenosis. So tell us a little bit about that and what's the significance, if any, clinically, how that would change management in your patients. There has been indeed a lot of discussion recently about low output, low gradient aortic stenosis. Well, first of all, you can have low gradient aortic stenosis if it's not severe. So moderate aortic stenosis would have would be low gradient aortic stenosis, that is, with a gradient of less than uh, 40 millimeters mercury. But other causes for low uh, gradient and low output aortic stenosis, and the most common one would be reduced ejection fraction. In that case, the stroke volume index will be reduced and the gradient may be less than 40 millimeters mercury, even though the valve area is clearly in the severe range and severe aortic stenosis is present. Sometimes dibutamine stress testing is useful in those patients just to confirm the severity of aortic stenosis. With dibutamine stress, you use low doses of dibutamine, you augment the stroke volume, and see what happens with the aortic valve area. It should remain in the severe, um, in the severe range if severe aortic stenosis is indeed present. 
But more recently, it's been recognized that some patients with a normal ejection fraction can have a low stroke volume index and a low gradient, even when severe aortic stenosis is present. And um, these are patients that seem to have remodeled in a different way. So they have relatively small left ventricular cavities and um, sort of thick walls and a stroke volume index of less than 35 milliliters per meter squared. And that number 35 is sort of arbitrary because we've looked at um, our population and actually your risk seems to increase before your stroke volume index gets that low. And it looks like it starts to increase even less than 43. Um, we find this circumstance to be present in about 3%, 3 to 5% of our patients with severe aortic stenosis. Um, these are often elderly women and atrial fibrillation is often present. And we don't know exactly why some people remodel this way. We've looked at um, serial changes in valve area and stroke volume index over time in patients who had serial echocardiography. And it looks like this is not like a burnt out stage that has gone from high gradient normal stroke volume to this stage, but it's just um, the way some patients have remodeled and they do have a worse outcome. So it's important to recognize them and hopefully recognize them early. I think that really is the key. And I think that speaks to one more question I think our viewers would love to hear because you've pioneered and have seminal work on lots of the history of severe aortic stenosis. What would you say are two to three very, very exciting or high clinically impactful observations from your work? Well, thanks for that question. I've been excited about aortic stenosis since I was a resident and saw my first patient. Um, but I think our approach to the patients has changed over time. You know, it was 30 years ago when um, Dr. Eugene Brunwald wrote a very clever editorial saying that the most common cause of sudden death in asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis was uh, surgical intervention. Um, now our surgical intervention has gotten so good that um, uh, you can expect a patient, oh, like an average 75 year old man, maybe with one comorbidity to get through aortic valve surgery with a, with a um, risk of death of only about 1% or so. Um, so surgery is a great treatment for these patients. We know that even in the asymptomatic patient, they have a high likelihood of developing symptoms over follow-up. In, in our study here of asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis with a peak velocity by Doppler of four meters per second or more, um, about half of those patients went on to develop symptoms within five years. And actually the patients that got intervention earlier had better outcomes than the patients where people wait and watch for symptoms to develop. In fact, our colleague, Joe Malouf, Malouf looked at um, uh, patients in the community with aortic valve stenosis, and it was super hard to tell who had symptoms and who didn't. Um, certainly in elderly patients, some of them have reduced mobility, and sometimes symptoms may be attributed to their lung disease or their inactivity or other things, or maybe patients just reduce their exercise capacity because, um, because they think they're old. Um, so um, it's, I think, potentially dangerous to wait for symptoms to develop. We also found that the risk of sudden death, and we defined this really strictly, these were sudden death in my series was patients who never had symptoms that could have been related to their aortic stenosis was about 1% per year during follow-up. Um, and so you're dealing with that potential risk, plus the risks of diastolic dysfunction, atrial fibrillation, fibrosis of the left ventricle, and decline in ejection fraction and stroke volume index that might occur while you're waiting for symptoms to develop or AS to become severe. It makes sense, right? So you have the, the valve lesion and then 
as you're speaking to, although we're classifying certain patients, or at least they're coming in as, quote, asymptomatic, they're still developing cardiomyopathy, and that puts them at other risks. So I really love, and I think we all appreciate all your work at challenging the dogma and then bringing forward new and exciting studies that bring data to help impact the clinical management of patients. And if I could just ask you one more thing, a kind of like a final point in your thoughts about the recovery trial. And I know our viewers would love to get your insight on that. Oh, thank you. Yes, the recovery trial is a multi-center study from South Korea that was published in New England Journal in 2020. Um, they studied 145 patients with asymptomatic, very severe aortic stenosis, peak velocity by Doppler of 4.5 meters per second, or valve area of less than or equal to 0.75 centimeters squared. They randomized them to either early surgery within two months or careful follow-up, and they followed them at three to six month intervals, watching for symptoms. And they found that the patients who had early intervention had better outcomes, better survival, even including um, surgical um, complications or surgical mortality. These patients did very well. So I think that that is further evidence that we should not be waiting when we are sure that aortic stenosis is severe. The other thing is that we now have TAVR as a treatment. On Although we don't have the real long-term outcome with the TAVR prosthesis, um, um, the short to intermediate term outcome is excellent and patients do very well with that procedure also. Excellent. So all fine points. I think it's an exciting time in the valve area, obviously in the echocardiogram area as well and the physiology behind it. And we thank you for your work and really thank you so much, Dr. Pelka, for these very important insights. Thank you for joining us 